All right, so we have Craig Martin here. He is the former open space specialist for the county of Los Alamos. He is a writer, a musician, and an avid hiker. His books, such as Los Alamos Place Names, Valle Grande, A History, uh, a History of the Baca Location Number One, and uh, 100 Hikes in New Mexico, have helped preserve history of the area and acquaint us with the importance of the landscape and use of the landscape for many, many years. Uh, Craig is a peak volunteer, a former, bur former board member, and a local author. And he was the Los Alamos County Open Space Specialist from 2003 to 2015. All right, well, I'll turn it over to Craig now and uh, monitor for any questions or comments coming in in the chat. And everyone can just enjoy. Hey, everybody. I recognize lots of names on the, uh, the participant list. I know some of you helped with this recovery 20 years ago, 21 years ago. Um, so we're going to take a journey through the Pueblo watershed in particular, and you'll see why in, in a couple of minutes, and look at how much that burned area from the Cerro Grande fire has changed in those 20 years. And the method we'll be using mostly is something that my uh, friend and colleague during those years, John Hogan, taught me. It's uh, called re repeat photography. And basically what it is is you find a, a picture and then you try to duplicate something like it at a later time. And you'll see that it was uh, quite a challenge to do that in some cases. And you'll see the technique that I used for some of that, that work. Well, here's what we looked at when we went up to the second floor of the library back in 1998. A uh, forested Sierra de los Valles, the mountains, the backdrop against Los Alamos. And they were covered with ponderosa pine and mixed conifer forests. And it was the place that we all love to go for hikes. We used it as our visual backdrop for our lives. And then suddenly, on May 10th of the year 2000, it turned into this. Quite a dramatic change. Uh, nothing there except for black standing sticks and gray ash on the ground in, in the burned area. Here's what it looked like on the ground. This is 1994, my family taking a hike up the Mitchell Trail. Uh, tall ponderosa pines, shady. Beautiful landscape. Here's what it looked like on May 24th when Miles Standish of the Forest Service, Janie O'Rourke and I walked up that trail. That's roughly the same place, the best I could, I could duplicate it. It was hard to pick out the same spots uh, after the fire went through. Another vision on the ground, this is 1994, a photo given to me by Bob Villa. I don't know if he's still in town or not, but I, I put out a call for pre-fire photos and he responded. I want you to notice, uh, well, I'd say notice this rock, but I don't think we're going to see it anymore because now it's buried under about two feet of gravel in the channel of, of Randia Canyon. But uh, we'll, we'll come back to this rock here in a bit so that you can see. So this is what we faced in, in May of, of 2000. And what it really meant was not only did we lose a landscape, people lost their homes, everybody's lives were changed in some way or another. But it also meant no vegetation means increased runoff. <clears throat> and this is a situation that you don't want to uh, be around. So what happens is the soil gets baked by the fire. The uh, organic matter forms a waxy coating on, on the places where the burn was intense. And this is uh, Tessa testing the soil. And you can see the little puddle of water that she has down here that uh, says that the water is not infiltrating into, into the ground. So, you know, it doesn't look like much there, but uh, when you get a quarter inch of rain or a tenth of an inch of rain, it suddenly uh, becomes a, a minor torrent, not much of uh, anything to absorb the, the rainfall there. Whenever we went to subsequent fires, this, this, this photo over here of the, the yellow shirts is taken at the Radio Cheta Sky Fire where people would not believe us what was going to happen when it rained, because we had seen it. This is what we saw in Rendia Canyon, 
I think this was a 2001 flood. This was an inch and a half rainstorm in about 10 minutes in the upper Rindia watershed, which had been entirely burned during the Sarah Boundary Fire. So this is what we were faced with. The good news is that whenever one of these fires happens, the Forest Service sends out a team of experts to look at the situation and evaluate how they can help stop that, that or reduce that runoff. It's a burned area emergency rehabilitation team. The bear team is what it's called. Uh, it's a bunch of experts from the Forest Service, from the Park Service, whatever agencies people can do. I served on a couple of bear teams with John Hogan uh, after the Sarah Grande because we had some experience in it. And people love to make maps, as you can see on the wall there. Uh, well, what they're charged with is the focus, focus on watershed stabilization to reduce post-fire flooding. And it's an emergency. See, see that up there in the, in the title? It's a burned area emergency, and that's the key. In the case of Cerro Grande, we had six weeks before the rainy season was scheduled to start. When we did Rodeo Chetiscai, we had two weeks before the rainy season was scheduled to start. So it's a true emergency. First thing they do is sit down and say, well, what are the really important things that we have to protect? They call those the values at risk. They prioritize them. The road to the hospital is always number one, according to somebody who I'll introduce to you soon. Um, cultural resources are another example. In the case of Los Alamos, there was an interesting one. There was a canyon downstream that had plutonium trapped in this mud sediments that had been stable for uh, 40 years, let's say, and the increased runoff had the potential to erode that canyon and release that plutonium to travel downstream. B big reason why so much money was spent here in Los Alamos. The team comes up with a plan and says, well, we only got so much money, what can we use? The cheapest thing is a log erosion barrier, straw waddles, a more expensive is aerial seating, Hydro mulching is a, a very cost intensive way of treating a burned area. And then straw mulching and seeding. You can see these are color coded on here, red line. You can see how much of the burned area was treated or, or scheduled to be treated by efforts with the bear team. We're gonna look at each of these methods individually, see how effective they, they were. Cheapest way to do it is you got a bunch of burned logs that are dead trees. You dig a trench for it. You roll it into the trench parallel to the slope and you stake it down and you say, well, when the water comes down the slope, it's gonna run into this barrier. Well, these things are kind of effective. They're not really terribly effective, especially when it crosses a small drainage like this one here. The only way to do, to get the, log in contact with the soil there is to cut it up into small pieces, put jam some rocks in there, hope for the best. Another thing that was used is straw wattles, which is a little bit more effective because what you could do here is uh, contour the wattle to the shape of the landscape. You can see little stakes in here the where they stake it down. And then when the water comes down, well, you can see on this one, where the water comes down through the, the little rill here and just washed out all of this stuff that was on the side. That's probably uh, hydro, hydro mulch. So they're not very effective. Uh, at, at best, this is the results that you would get. You would capture some seed that was part of the aerial seeding behind those log barriers. And, but in the center where the, the water would flow no matter what you did or around the sides, it, nothing would grow because of the, the uh, repeated flowing of water. So aerial seeding was the way, way to go for most of the burned area. And the purpose is to hold soil in place so that you can give the native species a chance to reestablish and to help it, it, to keep out some invasive species while you're doing it by providing some uh, ground cover. The first thing the bear team had to decide on was what's the mix of seeds that we were gonna to apply to 48,000 acres is about what they finished applying it to. And they decided on a, a mix of annual fast growing grasses like common barley and ryegrass that would shoot up right away, first time it rained. And then for a longer term solution, 
add some warm season grasses that were slower growing and that were perennials that would last for five to 10 years. And those species are mountain brome and slender wheatgrass. We're gonna become familiar with slender wheatgrass here shortly. Uh, here's the uh, bags that the seed mix is delivered in. It was stored at the airport. From there, the bags were dumped into that big container and dropped through that tube into the cargo area of the plane right in here. Underneath is a seed spreader, kind of like the kind that you would use in your yard, except a little bit bigger. And the plane took off, made many runs across the burned area and dropped seed covering about 48,000 acres. This map is shows by red lines the flights of the airplane as it drops seeds. Here's the Los Alamos airport down here where they all concentrate. The plane basically did this run here. The, these areas in here that are shaded a different color from red are the areas where either seed or hydromulch was dropped depending on what they were, were doing with that particular run. So you can see it's a huge effort that covered uh, most of the burned area. We're gonna look at the results of that aerial seeding. It started to work right away. It, the, the barley and the, the rye grass popped up within weeks because it's, we were fortunate that we had rain, a couple of small rainstorms uh, early on during that, that summer. And the reason for the monitoring of this has to do with the North Road flood from 2002. Um, big rainstorm in the Pueblo Canyon watershed that wiped out North Road. I don't know if many of you remember that part, but uh, it was uh, quite a dramatic event. Uh, the county said, well, you know what we need to do? We need to build a big dam across Pueblo Canyon, which was located, or scheduled to be located right where the only unburned forest in the whole area was. And the neighbors were upset. Did you know about the 42 foot high dam? My property values are gonna go down. Um, what we who had been involved in the restoration thought was, well, wait a minute, the watershed is almost recovered. It's got another year, but things are coming back. So we went to the county council and said, you know, this might not be a good idea. This might be a waste of some money. Uh, and, you know, the, the council said, yeah, okay, let's do it. So they hired this consulting team out of Santa Fe to go up into the watershed and put 20, 25 or 26 transects line, lines on the ground. And you can see a, a tape over here that is one of the transect lines. Uh, put those on the ground and do, do some vegetation analysis. Look at how much of the ground is covered with vegetation, how much of the ground is still bare soil, how much of it is bare rock, and estimate from that how much water will come down those channels when, whenever it rains. So uh, they established 25 100 meter transects. Um, they looked at the ground cover at every meter along that line and recorded that. And then um, when the volunteer task force, which at that time was uh, Ju June, my, my wife and I uh, did this, we also recorded what species were present within four measures. That's, so all I'm trying to say is there's a reason why that we have picture sequences like this. This is the repeat photography. Here is a steep slope. Aerial seed was its only treatment in 2002. And you can see that there's a couple of strands of slender wheatgrass. That's why we're gonna love slender wheatgrass because it's that yellowish grass that uh, grew fairly well in the first two years, but by the next year, it had really taken off. So in 2003, how much of the ground was covered? Well, probably 50% more by slender wheatgrass. And then the next year, slender wheatgrass and the slender wheatgrass stalks, the litter from grass stalks from the previous year that had been squished down by snow and shrubs started to come in and cover the area. And you can see the, uh, between 2002 and 2004, this is kind of what we were talking about when we went to the county council and said, you know, things are almost there, just give us some time and don't spend all that money. 
Well, they, they, they did spend most of that money anyway, but at least we didn't get a dam out of it. Here's another place on moderate slopes where you can see that it seems even more successful because the, uh, the runoff that did occur on those things was slower and they, there was more time for the water to, to infiltrate into the soil. So by 2004, you've had uh, so a pretty good grass cover. What we found in 2005 was that more shrubs were coming in and the trees were starting to fall. Here's 2009, the last time we went up there. Uh, same area, you see these little, this little flag here? And there's a little wooden stake here that marked the end of our transects. And that's how we were able to make these repeat photography things happen. Here's the stake. When we went back this past summer, 2019, to reread some of these transects and retake some of the photos, it was almost impossible to find those stakes, as you can imagine. I, I've got one example of that coming up for you. Here's some natural vegetation in Aspen. This area probably received some aerial seeding too, but you, if you look, you won't see any grass because it was outcompeted by the Aspens. By 2002, even, the aspens were ooh, maybe four feet tall. Here in 2004, they are much taller, maybe eight to 10 feet. And then they grow. But the important thing to notice about 2009 is how much of the ground is now covered with litter from those trees, the, le the uh, decaying leaves and the uh, the branches, the sticks, the, 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 you can see that there were many more stems in 2004 than there were in 2009. And that added to the protection of the ground. So the ground cover is increasing as time goes on. And that's, that's exactly what you want to do to control runoff and to bring the forest back with native vegetation. This is a scene along the Camazon Trail just above, well, if you know where the Cave of the Winds Trail is, it's just below that. And in 2003, the grass cover come back. And in 2019, all those dead trees are, are now part of the litter helping protect the ground. Here's a, one of those stakes that you can see a little bit better. This one is uh, looking up. You can see now the shrubs are really increasing in four years after the fire. And, and that's certainly what we found is the soil was retained enough by that slender wheatgrass to make it easy for the shrubs to gather nutrients from the soil. And as long as they had sufficient rain, they were ready to go. Uh, same scene in 2019, you can see how the aspens are starting to move in towards where the stake is. The stake was smashed by this tree when it fell. Uh, so part of the challenge was to uh, repeat those photos just to, to, and then finding the stakes that we did it. On rocky slopes, the effects aren't quite so dramatic, but one thing you can see here is that the planted pine seedlings, that uh, the, the, these particular trees, because they were far up the, the slope on the Camazon Trail, about two miles, were planted by a professional crew of uh, tree planters. But you can't see much bare ground in this anymore. The rocks are still there. This rock here is the same as this rock there. Mitchell Trail, again, here's the, the scene when there's nothing growing there right immediately post-fire. Same scene in 2003. Um, I'm looking for the rock there. You can see how much the channel has changed. This, this is where the stream used to flow here probably was down in, in this area in here. But in, with the, uh, the gravel coming down the, the channel from the, the eroding hill slopes above, it fills the channel with a lot of debris. We'll come back and look at that in particular in a couple of minutes. Here's the same scene in 2005. You can barely recognize it. In fact, it's getting harder to figure out that this tree is this tree here. This tree is there. Lots of shrub cover. And then 
Okay, so I'm not sure that this sequence is going to work as, as well as I wanted because we're on Zoom, but it's going to be a sequence of fading pictures and I'm not sure how smoothly they'll fade. But this rock here is the key. I will tell you exactly how the scene changes. So right after the, the fire, Jenny O'Rourke and Miles Standish and I are walking up the trail. And in 2003, there's that rock. And we've got grass cover, some shrub cover, lots of still standing trees. We'll see what we can do. The next one, here's the rock again. And you, it's starting to, to look like an oak scrubland now, uh, five years after the fire. In 2019, uh, even more dramatic, uh, the standing dead trees are down and shrub cover is such that you can almost not see the rock anymore. And just a, another view of it, because I wasn't sure if the, uh, the fading works really well uh, when, when you're do, doing a live stream. So take a look at those and I'll take a drink while you're doing that. Aerial hydro mulch was, a, 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 I think I say here, an expensive mix of seed fertilizer and tachyfier. So what it is, it's seed mixing with fertilizer, tachyfier holds everything together so that when it hits the ground, it kind of makes a thin layer of mat. It covers the ground and protects it instantly because it's, it's got a, a nice barrier to erosion. Plus, what it does, and we'll talk about this when we talk about mulching, it helps break down the hydrophobic soil. The uh, airplane flew hydro mulch. You can see a couple of green areas in here, but not very much of it. And the reason is it was very expensive and it was only used on the steepest slopes in the Pueblo watershed that threatened that slug of plutonium that was down canyon. <clears throat> Find over place here. Here's one place that it dropped in the Pueblo watershed. This is in 2002, I think. Um, you can see how dramatically the hydro mulch rushed the grasses back. This is 2003, and then 2009, uh, that area is covered with shrubs and the grass is really protecting the soil. So it was worth the hydromulch expenditure for some areas, but they couldn't do that for, for the whole area because it's just too expensive. So all of this is going on, the community is saying, what, what can we do to, to help recover from this fire? And you know, we couldn't take care of our friends who lost their homes. They, they were busy with a thousand tasks. We all needed something positive to make it make us feel like we were helping bring back the, the landscape to it its former, or some semblance of its former appearance. We needed some healing because even if we didn't lose our homes, we did lose our landscape. We, we lost places that we, we loved. Uh, even though they were still there, they were very different. Uh, everybody wanted to say thank you to the firefighters. Uh, so, so we're all saying, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? So the multi-agency volunteer task force was uh, put together by all the agencies that were government agencies that were around town and, and helping with the, re the restoration effort. And this guy was in charge, Greg Hyunjin. Uh, I don't think he started out in charge of the bear team, but he stayed with us for four years as uh, the bear team lead and saw a lot of the uh, a lot of these projects through. But the great thing that Greg did was he said, "Hey, we got all these people who want to help." Can we experiment with something that I've always wanted to do? I've always wanted to rake the soil, throw some seed down, and then put straw mulch down on top. And the reasons for this are by putting the mulch down, you created a barrier that it, you know, helps with raindrops when they fall that doesn't dislodge the soil. But more importantly, it creates a moisture level layer underneath the straw that helps break down that hydrophobic soil. So what you're doing here in seeding and raking emulsion, we all met at the library, got into school buses, got 
uh, issued hard hats and, and tools, had to wear long pants and, and sturdy shoes, uh, went and raked the hydrophobic soil. And these are areas that are fairly close to town that we did this in. So just above the Mitchell Trailhead and behind the Kamazon communities and 48th Street, yeah, that, that was where we worked on the, the first round of this. Raking the soil breaked up some of the hydrophobicity uh, right away. And then we threw down seeds. This must have been the first work party because there were enough hard hats to go around, I guess. Oh, you, you, see, you see this? Uh, you ever see me in town right now with an N95 mask? I still had one from the Sarah Grande Fire Night. That's what I wear around town right now. Um, the, the straws brought in on trucks and however they could get it here, the fire service crews helped distribute the straw. And then what we did is took those straw bales, took the, I forget what the little thing, the sections of the straw bales are, are called, we take those out, spread it on the ground, try to get about two to three inches, a nice, fair, even layer on that. Uh, when you had enough people out there, you could get a lot of ground covered. In fact, I think in the first year we did 1,600 or 600 acres of straw mulching. And you can see the ground just turns yellow as that wave of people come through working the, the straw. I've been waiting 20 years to show this picture. Proof that hay bales can fly. I, actually, what uh, what's going on here is in the more remote areas. The next year, we did some up on the Amazon Trail, up, uh, two miles up, and the helicopters would fly in with this, the hay bales and drop them. This one stuck in the top of a in Ponderosa Pine. Uh, this is a 2001 mulching, but you can see how large areas are covered with mulch. Broke down the soil quickly. Got that revegetation jump started. The results of mulch and non-mulch in 2004, you know, the, uh, the mulched area had more, far more vegetation than the, uh, the non-mulched area. And that's the, the trend that we found that, that mulch really did help the, uh, the native grass seeds get started and hold the soil in place. Areas where there was was repeating mulching uh, and nothing was done, um, which were very hard to find after the fire. Uh, this is what we found there. This is uh, mullein. Uh, it's, it's a non-native species. Uh, it, it takes over big areas. It's, there's still a lot of it up in there. Uh, this gray or the tan stuff is all horseweed, which is a really nasty little weed that takes over large areas. It needs to be controlled pretty well. So uh, the, the mulching really did make a difference. Sorry, it's Los Alamos, I needed to have a few graphs. Uh, it, I could talk you through this one for a second here. This, the, the blue bar is 2002. It's the total cover on the ground based on mulching and the things that had grown up in those two years. So most of the ground is covered with mulch. And some of the ground, about 35%, is covered with something that's either living or bedrock, something that would not erode. And that was the key to figuring out how much runoff there would be. In 2003, you can see that the mulch is starting to break down. But what's going on is that the vegetation cover is increasing. By 2004, that was the, the trend that was still going on. 2019, there wasn't any mulch that we could see anywhere. So all of that is that was that had been covered with the mulch has been made up with other things covering the grounds. Breakdown of those things here. Let's just look at 2019. You can see the trends are all there. So soil, bare soil is uh, down compared to the, the previous years. Uh, grass is not as dominant because those seeded grasses were there to stabilize the soil. They only had a, long, a life of five years or so. A lot of those have disappeared and have been replaced by native grasses. Uh, the forbs, which are the wildflowers that we all love, uh, have increased dramatically. 
and shrubs really did it. But the thing that really helps is 35% of the ground is covered by dead plants. And that's what really helps with reducing the erosion potential and the runoff potential now. Um, yeah, we had a couple of storm events like in 2013 when it rained seven inches in two days. Uh, we, we had flooding then, but that, that would, fire or no fire, you would have gotten that, the same results. But now um, in the Sarah Grande burned area, flow levels have returned back to their uh, pre Sarah Grande levels. Species diversity. Uh, in 2001, if you found an aspen shoot, that was about all you would find that summer. Uh, a few things came up a little later in the in summer after the rainy season. In 2001, when we went out there, we, we could see maybe five species. Four of those were probably the, uh, the grasses that had been seeded, but wasn't really very dramatic the first year. By 2002, it was easy to pick out shrubs. There were a, a lot of native plants coming back in, and we still had the uh, slender wheatgrass and the mountain broom covering lots of the ground. By 2004, we started to see some of the wildflowers that we, we know up in the burned area, but that was a dramatic increase in the number of species that we found within the burned area. So we jumped from one to 31 in four years. Um, surprising thing is in 2019 when we went up, and we didn't read all the transects in 2019, uh, we found basically the same number of species, but most of the non-native and seeded grasses had disappeared and everything had been replaced by native wildflowers and native grasses. Native grasses are mountain muley, little blue stem. Uh, the native wildflowers are the, the variety that we, we see whenever we go up for a hike. When Senecio was one of the first to appear, but now we've got the, the, the golden rods and most, most species that we had pre-fire came back in the last couple of, in the last 10 years. So the one thing that nobody realizes or few of us realize is because Greg Kimjian said, let's go do the seeding and raking and mulching, um, he had a chance to experiment and see how successful it was. So it was so successful that the next year when we had this group of 100 kids from Texas who wanted to do something because they had heard about the fire. Uh, they, they came up and we got to put them to use. That was got some more seed and, and, and mulch and we did another 600 acres in 2001. Greg took the mulching success at Cerro Grande and when we went to the Rodeo Chattisky fire, they experimented with what they called bail bombing, which was they would get the, the straw in a net, fly it over an area, and then open up the, the net that the straw was held in, and it would cover a larger area in a shorter period of time. Um, we did do some volunteer mulching just because it helps heal the community, but most of the, the uh, straw mulching that was done for that fire was done by helicopter. And then when Greg took it to the Heyman fire, which I didn't do, I, I guess I had a serious job by then. Um, he uh, did it on a larger scale and, and was covering maybe four or 5,000 acres with straw. Riparian is one of the places where well, the water flows before and after uh, the fire. Here, here's a, this is Kamazon communities on the left-hand side and the, I, Forget where, I guess if we call that the North Fork of Pueblo Canyon on the, through the center of the photo. Uh, it, this photo here was 2001, immediately after the fire department took down all the standing snags yes. in that area to, to increase the fire protection for the community. Uh, this picture was yesterday. Um, and what we did in areas like this is we got a, a grant to go up and plant, these are um, some cottonwoods, mostly box elders, uh, that we planted up through that channel. And you can see that they've uh, done a pretty good job. Uh, even here where we didn't plant anything, it was still uh, flowing the, the, slowing the flow of the water enough so that by the time it got there, we could establish some vegetation there. 
it, here's my second favorite sequence. Okay, this is called a cow catcher. It's a debris catcher. Uh, it's steel pipes stuck into the ground about 10 feet uh, so that they can withstand the force of a big, strong flood. So no, notice how the edges are sloping because I'm gonna show you the same scene, more or less, uh, taken two years later. Okay, here's the slope of the cow catcher right in here. <laughs> and here it is on the other side. It did its job. It caught the debris, caught the sediment, trapped it all behind that, slowed the gradient or, or reduced the gradient of the stream flow. So that's what it's supposed to do. Same scene a couple years later, you can still see a little bit of that, and, but you can see how rapidly the stream channel changes. This sequence here is, uh, this is Greg again, who said, you know, we should look at the changes in the stream channel. Let's use Rendia Canyon as our example and use it to teach kids. I think oh, it's uh, Ivana. Oh, okay, no, sorry. Um, this is probably kids from where was Ivana at that point. I think she was at Mountain School. Probably Mountain School students who strung these tapes across the stream channel and measured oops, the distance down to the stream channel. And for, that way they can make a stream channel cross section to estimate how much water would flow through there. This tree is the, the key for the next sequence, okay? Curved trunk tree. So in 2003, the channel had filled with the gravel from up above in the channel. In 2005, that flat level thing had eroded down in a series of floods. You can see different terraces on the, the channel over here. And, and this is the our key tree. So we, we've got a stream channel running through the middle of all that gravel again. 2006, not much change. We didn't have any big floods at, through those times. But in 2013, when the big flood came, here's our curved tree. And I couldn't get to the same spot that I was use, using to take pictures before uh, because the channel had changed so much. But the whole thing filled again with gravel because of things downstream that, that caught the gravel and, and caused it to fall out of the water as the water slowed down. Dramatic change that I, I couldn't believe when I went down there. And then when I went down the back this year, so constantly changing. And the, the key here is how well the water can flow through a section without being blocked off. Uh, with, by a debris dam. And that's why we, one of the things the bear team did was took all, all the trees, that, the fallen trees out of tri stream channels so that they wouldn't form dams. Uh, this sequence here is the Los Alamos Reservoir. I, I just want you to see how much it's changed over the years and why it's still such a problem. Pre-fire, here's post-fire. I'm not sure how many years post-fire, but you can see that, that they were pumping water out using uh, this orange pump that's over in the lower left-hand corner. And when they stopped pumping, the, it, it kind of filled up a bit. We're going to go and take a look. Well, here, here's when it was really filled uh, post-summer um, flows, I guess. I remember when it was like this, it was really smelly. We didn't want to be there. Okay, above the reservoir, here's the dam. We'll watch this sequence of series of changes. While they're pumping the water, the, the water's still flowing in from the watershed above, and the, the pump couldn't quite keep up, so there was still some water in there. And then they said, well, you know what? We need to dredge this out. Let's take all the gravel that's accumulated in the bottom. So pump the water, dig the gravel. I think they used it this year to, uh, that, the year that this photo was taken to, uh, put it on the American Springs Road to make it a, a good gravel road again. Same kind of thing, except now it's totally full. And then what happens is because the dam is stopping the sediment, it's filling up again. So we dredged it again, this time, uh, low enough water in there so that cattails could grow. And as the water drained out, the cattails died out. Guess what happened again? 2013, 
the, uh, the big seven inch rainstorm filled the reservoir again with gravel. Dredge it out again, pump the water around it. And so why does this happen? If you walk up the stream channel, you'll see that there's gravel covering the stream channel for three miles up the, the, uh, the channel. Greg and I dug a hole one day and it was eight feet deep. And all of that gravel has to come down to this reservoir. And it will be stopped by the dam and it will need to be redredged many times. Okay, that's my bad story, but here's my good story. April 2001, we wanna do some tree planting. Okay, so we bring the trees in with a far service. We store them in John Hogan's backyard because there was no other place to store them. Took uh, 120 volunteers three days to plant near the Kamazon Trail and another 120 to plant near the Mitchell Trail for another three days. Everybody really wanted to plant trees. I see uh, Dorothy Horde here, others uh, might be in there. Okay, so here, here's the, the story of the trees. Here's what they looked like when they went in when these Girl Scouts planted them. Uh, there's a little seedling in here. It's about nine inches high. In 2005, here's the GPS unit so you can see it's maybe three feet high. 2012, bigger than me. 2020, even, even taller. So trees are going. Here, here's what the, uh, the kids from Mountain School found in 2009. They measured, measured the average height of the trees in the Amazon watershed. Uh, in the area that we planted, and their average tree height was 22 inches, so about two feet in um, eight years of growth. This past fall with Megan Rains and Vanessa, who I see is watching tonight, thank you Vanessa, went up there with us, and we, kids from the middle school remeasured the tree heights. Their average height now is 12 feet plus, average diameter four inches. But the most interesting thing was, here's tree survival along the Kamazon Trail through the years. And we planted about 200 trees per acre in 2001. Forest Service told us to expect that only a third of those would live. By 2003, when we measured again, uh, about half of them had died, so we were still doing pretty good. By uh, 2009, a few of them had gone. But in 2019, there were more trees than there were in 2009. Why? Because the planted trees drop seeds and we have a second generation sprouting up along the trail already. So two things that uh, you should be encouraged about with this is that we did better than the Forest Service expected planting trees as volunteers because uh, Everybody cared about what they were doing and made sure that they did it right, made sure those trees went into the ground as far as they possibly could. That was the key. Plus, we got lucky and it rained that week that we planted the trees along the Amazon Trail. And it was a good inch rain, so that, that really got them started well. And the second thing is that those trees that are a mere 20 years old, 19 years old, are now producing their own young. Here's what it looks like on the ground. This was 2012 when you could start to notice those trees up along the Kamazon Trail. This is another fade. And here's what it was in 2019. So you can see those trees have really taken off. I remember people saying in, in uh, 2005 or so, it's too bad that tree planting thing didn't work. And uh, the results are pretty clear to me that it really did work. Lingering effects, well, we used to have a conifer forest uh, bordering town, now we've got an oak scrubland. The rise of uh, the dreaded New Mexico locust, uh, almost any place in the burned area you go, you're going to run into these thorns that uh, are nasty. Uh, mountain bikers on the Oahe Ridge Trail uh, hate these things because they, they come back with uh, rather cut up legs. But that, you know, it's, it's ground cover. It helps retain the soil. It helps cut down erosion. Um, even though I have a war against them, especially along trails, um, it's still, they're, they're still good. Uh, the bad part is 
despite all the, the efforts, uh, seeds from members of the composite family that get carried on the wind can travel a, a, a very long distance. And the three species of invasive thistles um, document that. These are musk thistles, bull thistles in the middle, and Canada thistles, which actually sprout from rhizomes and um, lingering effects on the landscape and community. Well, you know, the FEMA poured in about uh, $12 million to improve the forest conditions. So we actually have a much better fire, uh, a reduced fire threat around, around Los Alamos than we had before. The fire code was updated and the community became more aware of defensible space. Uh, here's my house before uh, I had it redone. Uh, you notice that the backyard is filled with ponderosa pines. Well, that's not a good way to have a house with board and batten siding and one of these cheap old roofs. So stucco on the outside, put a good roof on those emery or there's hardy boards in the um, eaves. That, that's what the building code did for us. Many residents still react to the smell of smoke. Whenever there's smoke, you'll notice that uh, Facebook lights up with what's going on. And really, um, you, even now, uh, the, the fire danger for, for town is, is greatly reduced. Uh, we, have, we have more open vistas from the streets and trails than we had before. The, the rocks on the backdrop of town are really amazing. Uh, the trail network got much improved because, well, I'll tell that story in part two. Uh, and then here's the, the key for me was the, the, the Los Conchas fire was far more intense. And without the serve, Grundy fire serving as, a, as a, a fire line for that fire, the Los Conchas fire probably would have raced into town and, and taken a much greater toll than the Cerro Grande fire did. So it's relentless greening and yellowing if you go up into Water Canyon in the fall. Um, I want to say special thanks to uh, John Hogan, Terry Fox, Laura Patterson, Jerry Washburn, Greg Kemjin, my wife June, Megan Rains, who took the kids up there to measure trees this year. And you know we had 5,000 volunteers back in the early days who gave 40,000 hours of their time to make all this or make it happen in a way that it was a shared community experience. If you want as part of a series of presentations that was supposed to happen on May 11th at the Historical Society. We've postponed that, but we don't know when it will be. But that will be a more community-focused presentation than uh, this one was, which focused on the, the natural vegetation. So um, I'll take questions from the, the chat. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Sorry I can't see you all in person. I miss you. <laughs> but we'll get there someday soon. Thanks. Thank you so much, Craig. We, we miss seeing everybody in person too. Here, I'll, um, I'll ask you to turn back on your video here and, um, and start asking some questions. So, um, so we, we do have a lot of questions that came in. And if anybody, <laughs> um, if anybody has questions, oh gosh, I see some more coming in as well. Um, uh, I'll try to keep up with those and we'll get as many as we can in uh, tonight. Okay, so first one is uh, like in two that like you showed in the photos from two thousand three. Why do aspens come back so quickly? At aspens are a colonial tree that uh, are. If you see a stand of aspens, it's all one tree that's connected by its roots. When the aspens burn off, those roots are still there and they're ready to go. In you know three three weeks, it was all it took before I saw aspen shoots coming up in the burned area because the roots can withstand the fire, they're buried far enough underneath, they don't get damaged by the heat. All right, thank you. Uh, somebody asked, where did, where did the shrubs come from? Were they seeds left in the soil, surviving roots, or what? Well, you know, e each shrub species has its own uh, story, but they were all natural. They, they, none of those were brought in or seeded. Uh, most of them, like the aspens, will sprout from roots. Uh, oaks are a good example. Uh, the Mexico locust, aspen, all, all will do that. Um, trying to think of what other shrub species that, that are out there. Well, there's lots of little things like um, serviceberry and things like that. So the, 
they're, they're all sprouting from roots. They're fire adapted species. All right. When we go hiking, are there seed packets we can take along and spread randomly for native plants to help the process? I think we're doing pretty good. I don't think we, we need to do that. Um, there is evidence, I call it the Southwest, uh, what was that, high, high Country Gardens, Plants of the Southwest mix. You can tell where people went up the Camazon Trail and threw that stuff out there immediately post fire because there are certain plants that you'll see that were not in the seed mix and that probably wouldn't get up there otherwise. An example is blue, blue flax was part of that seed mix. So if you see blue flax in the burned area, it's probably from somebody doing just what you're suggesting. But, you know, Forest Service doesn't like it. The, the county won't mind. Do what you want, that's what I would say. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see, I think you answered that one later in the talk. Um, I had a few people just tune in or chime in to, to say thank you, um, mostly during those, those photos of, the, uh, of all the volunteers and planting and spreading straw and seeds and raking the whole landscape. Um, just really, really worthwhile and you can see it from those photos. So I wanted to pass that along. Um, one person asked, um, were you disappointed that so many seeds uh, that were provided in the seeding efforts were non-native? And, um, and he remembers you, you not being sure that they would prosper at the time. And was this a correct assumption? If not, which ones actually did take? You know, there was a slide missing from my show that answered that. Ah, missed it. Anyway, here's what we found. We, we did monitor for invasive species that may have been purposefully inter or inadvertently introduced like cheatgrass. Cheatgrass was in 18 of the first year's transects that we read in 2002. In 2009, it was in zero of the transects. So that it, even if it was introduced by the seed, it died out pretty quick up there because it's just not its favorite habitat. The two non-native species that were in the mix, the annuals, barley and ryegrass. We didn't see that after 2003. The sunder wheatgrass hung around. There's still some up there. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a dicey native, you know. I don't think I've ever actually seen it in the Jemez uh, growing naturally, but uh, it, it's from close by here. So it's still there in small quantities and I haven't seen any mountain brown up there. So, um, anything that was in the seed mix that was non-native is, is not an issue up there right now. Wow, okay, awesome. Uh, can you comment on the effectiveness of the cow catcher in Rendija Canyon versus Upper Pajarito? Um, let's see, Upper Pajarito. Oh. No, they're, they're both full. They both, both did their job in the first two years and then they became a problem is, is my, my feeling on that. But um, no, I guess I didn't pay enough attention to the one up in the upper Pajarito Canyon. I know that the one in upper Pajarito looks a lot more like um, it, it cut out like downstream of it. So there's almost oh, yeah. a waterfall made of, made of concrete. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's true, yeah. Did its job too well, yeah. <laughs> too well. Okay, uh, where did the cheatgrass come from and can you talk a little bit about its impacts? Um, cheatgrass that's around town would be here anyway. Cheatgrass up in the burned area, uh, I do have a copy of the seed mix report where they looked for uh, invasive species seeds that were in the mix and it, it was pretty minuscule. I mean, some of it did go in there. There, were, there was one area that was seeded as a demonstration early on close to town where there was a lot of cheatgrass in the seed mix. But um, in the burned area, it's not a problem. In town, it is a problem, but that has nothing to do with the Sarah Grande fire, in my opinion. Okay, so those are the ones from earlier, and now I'm getting to the ones from the last <laughs> 10 minutes. So I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to keep up here. I'm, 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 I'm good, you know, 
however long it takes. And All right, we, we are backing right up to eight o'clock, yeah, so if anybody needs to go, we, we um, understand. But we'll, um, we will have a recording of the presentation, uh, and that should be available on our YouTube channel in just a couple of days, if anybody's interested there. All right, so next question here is, uh, are there any other local burned areas that would benefit from volunteer tree planting now? I get asked that question a lot. And I, you know, personally, I think the Sarah Grande fire got all the money that it ever deserved. It's time to put that money somewhere else. And that somewhere else would be the Los Conscious fire because that, that still, because it didn't have a, a, a nuclear weapons design facility downstream from it, didn't get as much money as this one did. Plus we lost houses too. Well, we lost houses in, in Los Conscious also, but no, I, you know the the this what do I want to say here? The fire safe tree density is a hundred trees per acre, and if the Camazon Trail is in any indication, that's what we have up there now. Behind my house here on Arizona Avenue, look out there. It's about a hundred trees per acre. We don't need any more trees, or else in fifty years we're back where we were in nineteen ninety eight. So, all that effort should go into locally the less conscious fire okay so what's the there are a couple parts to that question what's the most recent long-term prognosis for ponderosas on the pajarito plateau <laughs> yeah good luck with that one um uh i'm, I'm not sure i planted some uh, pinions experimentally uh, in this ponderosa zone uh, up here in town and that it, it's not it's not that warm yet. So I, I think you're going to see ponderosas hanging out for a while. Maybe not in town, but uh, certainly on the slopes as they come back. I think that the areas that were planted with the seedlings, I, th I think get enough additional moisture that they're, they're going to be okay up there. I know there have been a lot of recent conversations about, you know, whether the climate change climate warming is going to move the pinion juniper uh, up and you know replace essentially the uh, the ponderosa pine forests but um yeah i think that's a, that's an entire other yeah. <laughs> talk yeah well let's get um, nate in for that one <laughs> yes nate um one other thing i forgot to mention for the question before about volunteer tree plantings um bandelier just did, did just do one um up in is that Alamo Boundary um, Trailhead oh, boundary area? Trail, yes. Yes, yeah. just this past fall. So, so we'll be watching those and hopefully uh, participating in some more uh, efforts like that in the coming uh, years. They they got a whole bunch more trees this spring, and because they they couldn't wait to get them into the ground because you just can't keep seedlings in, in boxes forever. Uh, they they're they're planting them right now so there's a lot more there's probably another 10,000 trees going in th this spring for, by the bandolier staff that's great to hear um somebody wants to know what the estimated number of trees planted i'm guessing in the in the 2000-2001 um, efforts well volunteers planted 12,000 that was all they could come up with for their for us for the first year and that that was given to the community essentially as as a, a a way to help heal the community the next year professional crews came in and planted a hundred thousand further up the slopes um, best place to see those would be walk up the mitchell trail take the ridge fork and look to the south there's a hill slope there that's absolutely covered in ponderosa pines that uh, they planted uh, another place is uh, the back well Go up the Camazon Trail, look at the backside of essentially Burnt Mountain. It's a little further up than that, but there's a lot of trees up there too. I, I would estimate, based on what we see, that we have 50,000 Ponderosa pines that are 10 feet, 12 feet tall up in the burned area right now. Okay, so how long is that soil usually hydrophobic? If you don't treat it with mulch, it'll, uh, we went and saw some hydrophobic soil a year after the fire. 
So it, it does, it, it can hang around a lot if there's not a lot of moisture. But what breaks it down is, is, uh, is moisture and uh, the mechanical action of growing things. Uh, Greg would have a better answer for that than I do, but Greg's in Washington now doing the same thing. Okay, thank you. Why were the dead trees not cut down to help protect the ground from erosion earlier in the process? Uh, well, we all knew that uh, based on previous studies that it was six or seven years before the most of them would fall down. Um, when you're talking about, well, I can, can't even estimate how many trees there were that were burned in the fire. That, that's a massive amount of work. Um, that, that's, it's not cost effective. Uh, it's hard to get a tra trained sawyers to go up and, and take down trees. That's why you did, did it selectively with log erosion barriers. Yeah. Uh, where in Rendiha Canyon were the series of pictures taken? Um, it's just below the Mitchell Trail, below the big new water tank. So um, if you know where the fork is on the Mitchell Trail, one goes up the, the ridge line and it says the Mitchell Trail goes that way, and the other stays in the canyon bottom, which is an unofficial trail anymore. It's back towards town, maybe 200 yards, so right below that water tank. The tree is still there, or at least it was in the fall. Okay, somebody wants to know, are the invasive species all bad and should we try to remove them? Or are there some, is there some good in keeping them around? Uh, I can't think of any good. Um, we've been working steadily, uh, my wife June is, is uh, she, she hates thistles and we go out 25 times each year uh, to remove thistles. We have permit or volunteer permits from the Forest Service and the Park Service. Um, and and we, keep, we can't keep up. One of the things I was hoping to do with Peak this spring was to do a volunteer thistle removal in, in the skirt around the burned area. But uh, that, that's not gonna happen right now. Um, I can't think of any invasive species that I would wish was still around. Uh, things like cheatgrass are so universal that uh, you know that there's not really a solution for, for those. Uh, but thistles, you can make a dent. There used to be a lot of thistles, like in in this picture in Water Canyon. There used to be a lot of thistles along that way. But June has taken care of most of them over the last ten years. Uh -huh. Susan's asking about your background image and whether it's from the shuttle disaster which occurred on re-entry. Oh, sorry, that was Steve. Uh -huh. what, 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 what background image? I'm not sure if they might have seen your desktop or... Um, we can ask Steve for clarification and come back. <laughs> okay, yeah, we have a couple Steve. more relevant questions. Uh, do you, think, do you think Los Alamos will ever have a nice ponderosa forest in the Mitchell Trail area again? And how many years might it take to have that full canopy? Uh, let's see, to, to get a canopy on a ponderosa pine, you, know, you might be talking 75 years, so you, we got 50 years to go. So, no, it's, when we planted those, I'd never expected to see as much of a, a thick growth of pines as I do now. But uh, so we never expected to have, have the forest back. So don't, don't hold your breath on that one. It's coming, but it's not something that I will enjoy. I won't be around. So what did you find was the best way to manage large natural areas for fires? Uh, complicated question. <laughs> Um, in town, when I was in charge of the fuel mitigation project, what we did, uh, th the FEMA dollars went in and thinned the forest so that we could then go in and reintroduce fire in, into some of those, those, uh, those canyons. And that, that is the way to keep it going. 
is to get in there and when it's safe, under safe conditions, with a thinned forest that has a high base to the canopy of trees so that your grass fire is not going to burn into the treetops, then you, you just have to keep at it by reintroducing fire into that ecosystem. That's the way the ecosystem evolved. That's the only way you're gonna do it. Unless you've got a lot of volunteers who go out there and say, ooh, look at this, we've got 400 seedlings in this area, let's pull them. But when you multiply that by 4,000 acres, that's, that's an awful lot of handwork to do. That's why fire is the effective tool. Okay, so there are two questions about uh, wildlife on the Pajarita Plateau. Um, first, how are animals reacting to the invasive species of plants? And then also just more of a general, how did they react? Or uh, was anybody studying how wildlife reacted to the fires? Uh, you know, the deer population in Los Alamos is pretty crazy. The, the bears are increasing. Um, this year, since last summer, I've had more rabbits in my yard uh, than since the fire. And I'm right on the edge of the burned area. Uh, so I, I think most of the critters are adapted to fire, like uh, the, the trees are. And I, I, I think that's come back pretty much the same way as it is. The bird community has shifted, of course. The, uh, the birds that we used to have in the forest are, are hard to find, but the grassland open, open canopy forest birds are more common. What was the first part of the question? Uh, how are they reacting to the invasive species of plants? Ah, uh, the invasive species. Um, I don't know if there's much interaction between uh, thistles and, and any of the, the um, the wildlife we have around here. So uh, I, I don't think there's a problem, a mix between those two. Okay, so I think that is all of the questions that came in, unless anybody snuck one in on me. Um, so thank you so much everybody for sticking around. Uh, again, uh, just th thank you again, Craig, for uh, for sharing this incredible research and and history with us. That the the stories and and you know the differences and what we see now are are fantastic to hear about. Uh, okay, so everybody, please do look. Oh, what, the, just, yeah, what? Yeah. What was that? My 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 last comment would be. We came back from the fire, you know, we're going to come back from this virus thing too. So people are resilient and the fire taught us that uh, we, we can get through a hard time and re resume our lives the, the way we had them before, I hope. <laughs> yes, and, and thank you everybody for, you know, for bearing with us with the technology here and, you know, learning Zoom with us. and. And, uh, and joining our talks virtually when, when we can't be face to face together at the Nature Center. Thanks, Craig, again. Um, and we'll, we'll go ahead and end the meeting here. And everybody should have a good night and take care, stay healthy. And we hope to see you again soon. Bye.